first and foremost, welcome to all of you who are joining us today for the Center for Human Rights and International Justice luncheon colloquia without the luncheon part. I'm Brinton Likes, co-director of the center, and it is a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, before I forget and uh, move on to the most important information, which is introducing our speaker, I just want to remind everybody that um, Boston College records these sessions. Your name will not be mentioned if you have questions, unless you'd like to have it mentioned, but we're delighted to have Daniela here, and we hope that you don't mind it being recorded so that others who can't be here today have access to the important discussion that will be unfolding. Daniela Orosa received her PhD cum laude in law from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid in 2002, and her LLB summa cum laude from the Universidad Católica Andrés Bello in 1997. She has been a professor of administrative law, constitutional law, and human rights for more than 17 years in Venezuela and in other Latin American countries. She was a visiting scholar here at Boston College at our law school between 2017 and 2019, and the director of the Latin American Constitutionalism Program at the Klaus Center for the Study of Constitutional Democracy. She is the director of the International Human Rights Practicum at the law school here, and also teaches Spanish at our Department of Romance, Languages, and Literature here at BC. Dr. Yorosa is an international ally professor of the Universidad Católica Andrés Bello in Venezuela, and we are delighted to have her here today to speak with us about much of her work on the inter-American system of human rights and other issues in related human rights and international law contexts. So thank you all, and thank you particularly, Daniela, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Likes, for your kind introduction. And of course, thank you so much, Professor Canstrom and team uh, for this wonderful invitation. I'm, I am delighted to be uh, today in, in, in this event of the Center of Human Rights that is a wonderful and vibrant uh, event and, and vibrant center. So let me share my screen before to start. Okay. Well, so my idea today is to share with you uh, some ideas about the main trends and challenges of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, especially in times of pandemic. No? We will see how many uh, things are, are, are happening right now in the inter-American system of human rights, particularly in the court, and how the pandemic is changing few few things. Just to start uh, and trying to locate the inter-American court of human rights in the world of the inter international human rights protection system, uh, we can just uh, trying to remember that the international human rights protection system includes some regional systems for the protection of human rights. One of is the European system of human rights. The other one is the African system of human rights. And also we have the inter-American system of human rights, all uh, working in parallel uh, of the United Nations system that is the main international a system for the human rights protection in the world. So the inter-American system of human rights is one of these three major regional systems that uh, exist uh, right now in, in the world. Uh, maybe we can try to uh, define the inter-American system saying that is the system responsible for monitoring, promoting and protecting human rights in the region uh, for the 35 independent countries of the Americas that are members of the OAS. So the OAS or Organization of American States uh, created the Inter-American System of Human Rights and uh, that, that has two main institutions or two main organs. One uh, of, of these organs is the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights uh, which mission is to promote and protect human rights in the American hemisphere. Uh, 
uh, with jurisdiction over all the OAS member states. So the 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 of the Inter-American Commonwealth uh, to bring uh, support to the coast in order to promote human rights and all, also uh, bring reports and studies trying to protect human rights in a general way. In the other hand, we have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that is an autonomous judicial institution whose purpose is the application and interpretation of the American Convention of Human Rights. So we have both organs. We can see here in parallel both, very briefly, uh, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights headquarters is in Washington, D.C., has seven members that are elected by the General Assembly of the OAS, uh, used to be uh, uh, prominent scholars in the field, and the functions are basically, as I said before, to promote respect for and defense of human rights and to prepare reports regarding the human rights situation of the OAS state. And also they receive individual petitions uh, uh, that they then, if, uh, if they that is appropriate, they uh, pass to the court. In the other hand, the court has seven members elected by the state parties of the American Convention of Human Rights that are independent uh, juries. The Inter-American Court is part of the Inter-American system, but it's out of the OAS, so it's an independent or autonomous organ and uh, has two main functions, a contentious function to resolve individual cases and also a, an advisory function to interpretate and create and bring uh, new standards uh, for the protections of human rights in the Americas. But I, I, let's see uh, more directly the impact of the court. I will try to avoid so many legal issues of the functions of the court uh, because uh, not all of our attendees are lawyers or uh, law students. So let's try to be a little more general and talk about the impact uh, uh, and the trends of the, the court. The Inter-American Court, I have to say, is a very progressive and vibrant regional international, uh, sorry, uh, regional human rights court. Uh, the court uh, has had a very important impact in the Americas uh, region development, especially in the Latin American countries, and also a great impact in the human rights protection. Uh, a few uh, constitutional reforms in, in some Latin American countries, for example, Chile, a few years ago, uh, are because of the Inter-American Court decisions uh, so many legal reforms in the regions are because of the Inter-American Court decisions and definitely all the standards for the guarantee of human rights in the regions are because of the Inter-American Court jurisprudence. So the impact is, is, is really huge and not as we will see uh, in a few minutes, not only in the regions, but also in other uh, international system of human rights. Sometimes the European Court of Human Rights and uh, also the African Court of Human Rights look the Inter-American Court jurisprudence uh, before uh, take a decision. Is that they talk and they call the dialogue, the jurisprudential di dialogue between the European Court and the Inter-American Court. Uh, and we have to say it's a very progressive and has a great impact, the Inter-American Court, even though it is a very small court, it only has seven judges. We can compare with the European Court of Human Rights that has 47 judges. The Inter-American Court only have seven. And the, the Inter-American Court only receive and more or less decide 15 to 18 cases annually. So it's not a court that is deciding hundreds of cases daily or monthly or annually. It's just a few cases, but are cases that have a great impact by, by itself. Uh, the, the court has a really low budget. You will about that at the end. Um, 
uh, has a challenge uh, comparing with other international institution and especially other international courts, the budget of the court is really small. And uh, even though that the impact is big. Let's see, I, I want to share today uh, the main trends and impact of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So the main trends of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court that have had impact in terms of uh, protection of human rights, not only in the region, but also uh, in front of other international courts of human rights. I think we can uh, talk about five main trends in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The first one is the human rights growth of the court regarding uh, the scope of right to life, the scope of human men personal uh, forced to disappear, uh, how to fight against judicial execution. One uh, is all the jurisprudence regarding essential rights for democracy, rule of law, how the court has this. Uh, in protection of the freedom of speech, the right to vote, political participation, and important what they, they call the right to democracy. We will talk about that a little bit more uh, later. In third place, um, probably one of the, 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 the most important uh, cornerstone of the Inter-American Court jurisprudence is the protection of people and groups in special conditions of vulnerability. Uh, related also with the with that protection is the social, cultural, and environmental rights protection and how the court is to bring and direct enforcement enforcement of. And finally, uh, the right to a remedy and rep an integral reparation and how they call in leading in that. So I will try to explain briefly one of them uh, and see uh, after that the challenge that the, these main trends are, are, are looking right now. So uh, the first one, human rights gross violation. Uh, the Inter-American Court of uh, Criteria and the human rights protection uh, since the beginning or, or since the origin of the court is going always in parallel to the political and social uh, situation, sometimes crisis in the region. All the time, uh, the court is trying to protect human rights in the content in the context of the social and political problems in each, in each time. Uh, the first stage of the court, the, the beginning of the court uh, coincided uh, two or, or 30 years ago, more or less in the 80s or, and the 90s uh, with the military dictatorships that were, that, that were very common in Latin America. We are talking about the dictatorship in Argentina, in Chile, in most of the Central American countries, or Honduras, Guatemala, all the political com conflicts in Colombia. Uh, so the, the, the court started uh, its work fighting against uh, this dictatorship. Uh, due to that, the criteria uh, of the court at the beginning of, of its first decisions was about the protection of right to life, human treatment, personal liberty. And I have to say it is a criteria that has ha, ha, have had a wonderful, um, has been assumed the European Court of Human Rights in so many cases, especially uh, regarding uh, forced disappearance. We have at least three landmark cases here. The first one is Velázquez Rodríguez versus Honduras. It was the first, the very first case, very first contentious case, we have to say, of the court in 1988. It was a case of a forced disappearance uh, during the dictatorship in Honduras. The second one is Mir Mirna Mac. Mirna Mac was a human rights defender uh, in Guatemala that uh, suddenly disappeared and was executed. And finally, La Cantuta uh, versus Peru, 
during the dictatorship of, in Peru, and it was the uh, murder and uh, forced disappearance of a group of uh, students of a university, and also a few uh, law professors uh, also with them. So in these three landmark cases, the court uh, establishes so many important uh, criteria regarding the human rights gross violation. First, the interpretation and the scope of the right to life. Uh, second, the scope and consequence of the forced disappearance of persons. When we can talk about the forced disappearance, what are the characteristics of, uh, of the forced disappearance? And maybe most important, the responsibilities of the state uh, in, uh, before uh, the serious violation of human rights and when happened a uh, forced disappearance and extrajudicial execution. Uh, very important also is the limit of the disproportionate use of the public force that was, uh, was a time of a very violent police actions and the Inter-American Court tried to put a limit to this disproportionate force. And finally, another very important uh, trend in uh, regarding human rights violation has been the amnesty law, the, the criteria of the court regarding amnesty law. The court in a few cases, one of them, again, La Cantuta versus Peru uh, against uh, Chile, is that amnesty laws uh, that allow the forgiveness and impunity of gross violations of human rights and mass atrocities are absolutely contrary to the American Convention of Human Rights. So it's not possible uh, in the American states uh, to enact amnesty law that, uh, that allows the impunity, as I said before, of gross violations without violate the American Convention of Human Rights. And due to that, so many amnesty laws uh, in different countries uh, sh should be overruled and the transitional uh, justice process in so many uh, Latin American countries has been limited because of this criteria of the court. A second trend is the uh, human rights, democracy and the rule of law uh, in the Inter-American Court. The American Convention of Human Rights and in general, the Inter-American System of Human Rights bring protection of all the traditional political rights in a very expansive uh, way. Freedom of expression, right to vote, political participation, right to protest, tra transparency, access to justice, due process, et cetera. Probably uh, what I think is uh, different or where, where I think the court is leading in that field is uh, because the court uh, understand that uh, in the inter-American system, we, we can talk about a right to democracy. The right to democracy is a uh, general, we can say principle uh, included in the inter-American democratic charter. The inter-American democratic charter was signed by all the OAS states and recognizes the right to democracy and the mechanism in alteration or rupture of the democratic and constitutional threat in one of its member states. Is what to do in terms of uh, human rights protections from the inter-American system of human rights when, in, when one or more states uh, has problems or, or challenges uh, regarding democracy. Uh, currently, we have so many examples. Venezuela is one example. Nicaragua is another example. Honduras, maybe. Bolivia, until a few months ago. Uh, and what uh, can do the inter-American system uh, is really important uh, to fight to the uh, democratic backlash in the region. So the court has been uh, leading the idea or the criteria of our human rights to democracy. Uh, currently, there is an important advisory opinion request, number 29, uh, before the Inter-American Court. The hearings were um, two or three weeks ago. 
uh, and they are discussing if the indefinite presidential reelection is or not a human right, or if the indefinite presidential reelection is contrary to the uh, human rights to democracy. So it's a very inter interesting case that is um, discussing the Inter-American Court right now. And so many uh, states uh, participate in the hearings, including, including the, the United States, actually. So yeah, uh, as I said before, the demo democracy and the right to democracy is right now an important topic in the inter-American system of human rights. We can see how uh, in 2019, most of the reports of the Inter-American Commission, not only the court, but also the commission of human rights were uh, uh, regarding uh, topics of, of democracy, elections, and, and freedom. We have uh, the report of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights about freedom of expression, fake news, and elections, 2019. Also regarding anti-government demonstration and human rights, and the free, open, and inclusive internet access on human rights. All of them include so many standards uh, regarding the protection of the main political uh, rights and freedom, freedoms in democracy. So it's a, it's a main uh, trend right now. Third uh, trend, we can, as I said before, uh, one of the cornerstones on, in the inter-American system of human rights is the protection of the vulnerable population's human rights. Probably uh, the reason is because Latin America is the most unequal region in the world. So it's very important to see so many groups that are considered uh, vulnerable in Latin America. So the court, uh, the Inter-American Court from its very beginning has been trying to bring a special protection to the different groups that are considered vulnerable. And each one of them uh, also have a different protection um, regarding the special needs of each one. So the court considered vulnerable women, also children, also elderly people, Afro-descendants, immigrants, indigenous, disabled people, LGBT, uh, person deprived of liberty, and in different contexts, also political leaders in, 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 in different uh, countries, not all the countries, but in so many countries, political leaders are also vulnerable populations, especially in countries under authoritarian regimes. Same thing with human rights activists, journalists. So it's really uh, uh, impressive how so many different groups are considered vulnerable, sometimes uh, due to, po to political reasons, other, uh, in other times because of social reasons or a structural reasons, contextual reasons. It's, it's, it's really amazing how the courts try to bring protection uh, in, a, in a different way to each one of them. Right now, for example, um, journalists and also um, medical uh, personnel are considered vulnerable during the pandemic and they, uh, they should have an special protection because of that. Um, the court uh, jurisprudence regarding a vulnerable population is really robust. Uh, there are so many important decisions about uh, children's rights and how to protect children as vulnerable population, uh, also women. And within uh, women, we have also other uh, different subgroups, for example, pregnant women, for example, indigenous women, for example, political uh, women in political field. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see the different protection of, of some of them. Indigenous uh, people is uh, a, a, a population that is definitely very important in the inter-American system of human rights because there are so many Aboriginal uh, groups in the Americas. Uh, all of the, some of them with different interests and different uh, 
needs, but all of them vulnerable. LGBT uh, individuals also is a main trend of the court to bring them a special protection in the last few years. One of the main decisions is Atala Rifo versus Chile 2012. Another one is Azul Rojas versus Peru 2020. Uh, disabilities uh, has been a, 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 a problem that the court has faced in so many times. One is uh, Jimenez Lopez versus Brazil. Another one, Chinchilla Sandoval and Furlan versus Argentina. And how to bring them as a, a as I said before, and a special protection, and also so many ways of affirmative actions in order to bring them an equal protection uh, uh, of, the, of, their, of their human rights. Also related with vulnerable population, probably we have the four main trend. The fourth main trend is the protection of economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights in the inter-American system of human rights. Uh, we are talking about, of course, right to health, education rights, right to housing, right to social security, right to a healthy environment. I think uh, the inter-American system and most of the uh, Latin American countries and the Latin American domestic law are very generous in terms of the protection of economic and social rights, but the problem is the enforceability of these rights. So the court, uh, in order to bring a better protection of these economic, social, and cultural rights, I think has been evolving during the time and changing the way of protection. Uh, I should say that the court have been, uh, the jurisprudence of the court has like three phases in, an evolution, in evolutional terms, no? And a phase, one phase, the first uh, uh, stage, can we say, uh, was the indirect protection of the economic and social rights. Uh, from the very beginning of the inter-American system of human rights uh, with, the, with the American uh, Convention of Human Rights and then with the Protocol of San Salvador in 1988, the economic and social right has been recognized and has been uh, understood that the economic and social right are really human right and should be protected. But of course, even though it, uh, th this right were recognized, the protection of that rights uh, were indirect protection. The court protected economic and social rights through other rights in, in its first uh, decisions, through the right to life, through the right to dignity, through the right to property, the court brought protection to the right to education, right to health, uh, right to social security. For example, the case of Jimenez Lopez um, versus Brazil was the protection of the right to health of a mental disabled person through the right to life. Or Gonzalez Jui versus Brazil, 2015, also the protection of right to life through uh, a human dignity, for example. But then uh, the court evolved in the interpretation of the American Convention of Human Rights and the interpretation of the Protocol of San Salvador and started understanding that the uh, protection of economic and social rights should be in a direct way. So uh, starting with the case Lagos del Campo versus Peru was a case of labor rights uh, the court understood that the social rights, for example, labor rights, should be directly protected, even though the, uh, they can protect or not other rights, for example, like right to life or, for example, right to dignity. So uh, the, uh, in, in the case of Lagos del Campo versus Peru was the uh, labor rights in the case of Cuscul uh, Pivaral versus Guatemala 2018 was the direct protection of the right to health. That case was 
34 or 38, I don't remember now, uh, persons that were, that were uh, infected with uh, HIV and the court decided the, the direct protection of them. And we can see how it was, it is a very new uh, jurisprudence is a very new trend. It's only 2017, 2018, uh, when the court uh, started this direct protection. Um, I think we are facing a, a new stage, a third stage after the direct protection of economic and social rights through the court, and is the effectiveness of the court judge, judgment in the protection of economic and social rights. Uh, it's not enough to have decisions of the court protecting directly economic and social rights. The, at the end, the main problem is to have effectiveness of the court's decision. And the, not, not always the, the courts are really effective in terms of uh, social and economic rights protections because, as I said before, the inequality in the region is a main challenge. The economic situation in the region is a main challenge. So the, uh, also the um, institutional weakness of so many countries is a challenge. So it's not enough to have uh, direct enforceability through the court. I think we, the court, one of the challenge, we will talk about that, uh, later is to have more uh, connectivity with the state in terms of uh, how to protect with effectiveness the social and economic economic rights. Finally, uh, okay, I will I, I have to run a little bit. I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time. The last trend is the right to a remedy and integral reparation. Um, the court has been definitely, a very uh, progressive in, in that topic. Uh, the Inter-American Court jurisprudence has a great impact in terms of reparation methods. The American Convention of Human Rights, of course, include the obligation of states to provide comprehensive reparation for victims of human rights violation, but the method of the court has been very progressive, as I said before. Actually, the European Court of Human Rights and the African courts uh, used to follow the reparation decisions of the court and the Inter-American court jurisprudence in that field uh, uh, serve as inspiration for the basic universal principles of the United Nations of, on the right to reparation in 2005. So the, the jurisprudence of the court is really, really good in that topic. Uh, the remedy very, very briefly, the remedy and reparation measures that the court used to uh, apply are uh, not only economic satis satisfaction, but also trying to restitute uh, the situation uh, to the state that it was before of the violation of the human right, uh, including, for example, rehabilitation, psychological rehabilitation, medical rehabilitation, sometimes economic rehabilitation, and also, so many non-repetition guarantees that is really interesting. For example, um, ordering uh, a special educational plans in order to avoid future uh, violations in the same sense of the of the of the of a specific victim, uh, and so many. Uh, different ways, as I said before, not only economic satisfaction in order to bring reparation to the victims. So the uh, judicial investigation uh, orders are uh, almost all in all the decisions and also the payment of legal fees and ex expenses by the, by the country. So I, I don't have too much time to go deeper here, but it's one of the main Trends uh, and I, and I and as I said before, is one of the the jurisprudence uh, cases that the other um, regional system used to look very very commonly uh, of the Inter American Court. And just in the last few minutes, try I will try to talk a about the main challenges of the Inter American Court of Human Rights. I think the courts. 
uh, currently has six main challenges that are a lot. One of them is the universality of the inter-American system of human rights. The second one is effectiveness and budgetary challenges. Third one is effectiveness and procedural celerity. Uh, the fourth is inequality uh, versus social, economic, and cultural rights. We were talking uh, about that, how the inequality is a big challenge in the region, and due to that is a big challenge for the court to bring uh, better protection to social, economic, and cultural rights. Democracy backlash is a main issue right now. So many countries, as I said before, are suffering uh, authoritarian governments or governments that uh, started being democratic but are already more authoritarian than before. And finally, the COVID-19 is a main challenge. I think we can talk briefly about the one, the first, second, third, and the, the and COVID, because we can skip inequality and democracy backlash because we already talk more about that. Uh, universality, the main problem or, uh, or, or one of the main problems of the inter-American system of human rights is the universality. The OAS has 35 members, but only 23 of those countries ratif already ratified the American Convention of Human Rights and only 20 countries accepted the inter-American court jurisdiction. At the same time, only seven countries in the region ratified all the treaties of the Inter-American System of Human Rights. We are talking about the, the, um, the San Salvador Protocol, Belén do Pará to the protection of uh, women against violence, prote uh, conventions the, of the right of indigenous people, right to children. So only seven countries ratified all the treaties and only 20 countries are under the inter-American jurisdiction. Due, due to that, we cannot talk about universality right now in the region in terms of human rights protection, which is a, a, a big challenge uh, for the inter-American system of human rights and especially for the inter-American court of human rights. So it's not enough to have an universal recognition. When I say universal in terms of regional recognition of human rights, uh, but it's also important to, ha to have an universal acceptance of all the instruments and especially the compliance, the universal compliance of all the standards, recommendations, recommendation, uh, recommendations of the commission and also decisions of the court. Because of that, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is trying to bring uh, a more universal knowledge of their criteria, for example, is trying to bring educational plans and edu to, for the promotion and demand of human rights. All the time the court, the Inter-American court is organizing a special conference, a special seminars uh, for public services in different countries, or for example, to a police department in one country that has special problems in terms of uh, police violence. So he's trying to go deeper and bring a better knowledge of the protection of human rights to the common people, the population, schools, and not only in a high uh, academic or political level. This is a main first uh, challenge. Second challenge is the effectiveness and budgetary uh, challenge. The Inter-American Court is the poorest court in the world and the Inter-American system is the poorest system in the world. Uh, the Inter-American system uh, uh, budget uh, in 2015, right now it's a little bit better, but the proportion is more or less the same, was only $8 million. The African, uh, instead of the African human rights system was 13. And the uh, Council of Europe for the pro pro promotion and protection of human rights was 100 million euros. So it's really, really uh, different. Uh, and uh, it's a big gap from one to others. No, we can compare 
the European Court of Human Rights and the little small uh, house of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that, as I said before, uh, has only seven judges. So it's a big challenge. And without a great budget, it's probably really difficult to advance in terms of human rights protection. And also, uh, this is one of the reasons, the, the low budget of the lack, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons of the lack of effectiveness uh, and the lack of procedural celerity. Uh, has Dulitsi said uh, in terms of uh, inter-American system, too little, too late. Uh, we can say, we can see here very briefly how many years took a case to be decided. Uh, in, in, in blue, for example, we can see that uh, uh, the average age, uh, years from the time the petition, a petition is filled before the commission until is referred to the court is more than seven years in the commission. And also in red, we can see the average years from the time a petition is filled before the court is right now uh, one year and a half, more or less. So it's trying to, to have a, a better timing. But in, uh, in an average years, having the commission and the court time, we can talk about more than nine years. So each petition, uh, more than nine years for each petition is really, really slow. It's not an effective uh, protection of, in terms of, of time no? for the human rights. So uh, the timing is now a little better, but they need to improve. But of course, again, without budget is really, it's really difficult. And just to conclude, I promise I am absolutely out of time. Uh, the pandemic is a big issue right now. The court is trying to face the COVID-19 in terms of bringing standards to the countries of how to face the pandemic. Due to that, uh, the court uh, approved the declaration number one, 2020, uh, regarding COVID-19 and human rights, the problem and challenges must be approached with a human rights perspective and respecting international obligations. So there are more or less 30, 35 standards regarding how the state should protect freedoms, how the state should respect uh, uh, freedom and human rights uh, uh, while restricting and um, having uh, the all the police force, a special police force and a special punishment due to the pandemic, and also how to guarantee social and economic and cultural rights during the pandemic. So it's a it's a big challenge that the court is facing right now. Then just to conclude. Uh, I think we can say that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is a progressive regional court for the protection of human rights. Uh, its impact on the hemisphere and in other international protection system of human rights has been crucial during these 40 years of the court. And its main challenges uh, are the universality, effectiveness, celerity, and inequality in this time of, of pandemic. I am confident that the court will be will have a, a better performance all the time as now. And just finally, uh, a kind invitation uh, to participate. Uh, we will have an international colloquium on the Inter-American System of Human Rights uh, that is co-hosted uh, by the UNAM, the University uh, Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, with uh, BC Law School through the uh, International Human Rights Practicum and also some others international uh, human rights clinic of uh, some New England university, including BU, including UMass and some others. And we will have so many super interesting panels on Thursday, tomorrow and Friday. Uh, we will have the uh, the vice president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, the former president Ferrer of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and also panels 
regarding vulnerable population rights, gender, indigenous, migrant disappearance, democracy and human rights. So you are more than welcome to join us uh, for all the panels or some panels if you, if you want. And just thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. I think I, I have been longer than I su was supposed to, to be. Uh, I just want to finish with a wonderful picture of our field trip last semester with the International Human Rights Practicum student and also with Professor Canson that joined us uh, to visit the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And we had a, a, wonderful, a wonderful trip. I hope we will be there sooner than later uh, after the pandemic that we ho all hope it will end very, very soon. So thanks a lot. And I don't know if, if you have any question, uh, I am more than happy to, to answer. Well, thank you so much, Daniela. That was a wonderful presentation, very wide ranging and comprehensive and sophisticated. And thank you also for helping me get to the court uh, last year. It seems like so long ago, I noticed nobody was wearing a mask. We were all so innocent and <laughs> everything was different. Um, we have a couple of questions. We really don't have much time. We have about eight or nine minutes. Um, I had wanted to ask a, a very general question, but I think I'll um, defer to two of the questions that were posted here. One is quite specific and it actually relates to the question that I was gonna ask about the legitimacy of the court and how these things actually work. So one person has asked, how does the court bring justice to victims once the case is ruled on? And obviously justice to victims can be a very big set of issues, what you mean by justice and who you mean by victims. Um, but maybe you could try to answer that. And let me read the other one because again, we're, we don't have much time, so it might be better to just put them both out there and then you could talk about both. Um, the other question is, how can we deal with a dichotomy where many Latin American countries have strong liberal laws paired with weak enforcement and high levels of corruption? For example, women's rights in Ecuador. Uh, also, given the high levels of inequality and instability, why does the inter-American system receive less in monetary contributions than the African Court on Human and People's Rights? And I think both of those questions go to the questions of the issues of power and legitimacy of the court. Uh, I'll just say very briefly myself that the jurisprudence is very inspiring as you lay it out. The trend lines are very optimistic the way that you've laid them out. Um, but the reality, of course, is very troubling in that the court has, uh, what is the real world effect and how is it going to change some of these things in the hemisphere and beyond that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, th there are a big challenge for, for the Inter-American Court right now. Uh, the legitimacy is, is, is a big issue. Uh, the power, as you said, and yeah, the how to deal with the economy, starting with the, with the last question, how to deal with the economy. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, the, the, as I said before, the Latin American countries uh, are suffering right now so many big problems. One problem is economic crisis. One problem is corruption. Uh, and in social terms, we have a, very, a big problem of inequality. Maybe at the end, everything can be uh, uh, summarized in, in a problem of weak democracy. We have weak democracies and we have a weak um, institutional system in the state. And because of that, it's, it's challenging to have an effective uh, human rights protection system because the protection of, of human rights is not, not only depend of the of the court, not only depend of the inter-American system, the court and the commission, but also depend of the commitment of the state and the capability of the state to bring uh, protection. So um, I think uh, the inter-American system has to work uh, more deeply in, in, in terms of not only uh, bring uh, formal protection through inter-American decisions, but also in terms of public policy, for example, how to, uh, to bring a better protection within each one of the states 
uh, but it means uh, a, a stronger state, a stronger institution to bring a better, a better protection. No, this is a main, uh, a main issue right now. I don't know if I am missing one of the question or part of the question, uh, but yeah. Well, maybe you talk about the more specific first one also in terms of particular victims once a case is ruled on. Does the court, uh, can the court actually bring justice to particular people in that way? Yeah, I mean, uh, when we have a individual, so the individual petitions in the Inter-American System of Human Rights go first to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. So the, the victims go not directly to the court. They should go first to the Inter-American Commission the Inter-American Commission uh, study the case, sometimes uh, called for hearings, the, court, the, the country, uh, the victims, and is the commission who, is, who goes to the court with the cases in order to bring uh, protection. Once the commission go to the court, uh, the victims uh, are part of the case, of course, they, uh, they can go to the, uh, to the hearings before the court and every person that is interested in, in participate or, or uh, third part can, can, can also go there. Probably this is another, uh, in, in certain way, this is a challenge for the court, how to bring a more immediate protection uh, to the victims no? and have the, if, if, we, if we want to have a more universal system, as I said before, universality is one of the challenge. Uh, one of the solution could be to bring a more direct protection victims through through the court. So uh, this is one one of the issues. But of course the problem as, as it is, for example, in the in the International Criminal Court is that the more vigorous the court becomes in actually enforcing these norms, the more governments tend to resist the power of the court. So it, when you have a relatively weak court to begin with that's dependent for its funding on the very governments that it's policing, this can be very difficult as compared to the European system where the court is more set within the, the power of the Council of Europe and the European Union, the inter-American system was never, did, was never that robust in the same way. Exactly, exactly. This is one of, this is one of the things that I, that probably the inter-American system of human rights can look from the from the European system of human rights. Definitely, yeah. Well, I think we have uh, no more time for questions on this. Brinton, did you want to add anything or say anything? My, mine is a uh, a more a broader question, but I'll put it out there for perhaps another conversation, Daniela, on another day. One of the things that um, on the one hand, I've been a great fan of the court in large part because of the role it's had in Guatemala over many years. On the other hand, um, one of the um, challenges for me as someone who works with um, people who have been directly affected by armed conflict and in, in transitional justice issues is the language of vulnerability. The, the mechanisms that one has available to bring things before the court whether it's uh, people with different um, abilities, gender violence, indigenous people, um, forces people into the role of victim as opposed to recognizing that despite the fact that people have been victimized, marginalized, oppressed, that they have strengths and it takes a huge strength. Um, Helen Mack is a friend of mine and the years of hers work that it took to bring that case. And so it's a question about whether or not and in what ways the legal system um, can think about a more holistic way of thinking about people and their challenges and, um, and what some of the costs of using this language of vulnerability constantly are. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Daniel. sorry, go ahead. No, very, very briefly, because we are uh, running out of time. Yeah, as I said before, the, for me, uh, probably the protection of vulnerable population is the, is the, is the, uh, is the best, uh, uh, I mean, uh, is the best contribution of the inter-American system 
because it's changing and it's impacting the the whole system. No, the even in in a domestic law. No, we can talk right now about uh, and in terms of constitutional law, for example. Not only it's not only impacting international law, also constitutional law. They talk about the uh, jus constitutionale comune in all the countries, and one of the reasons is this protection of vulnerable population due to the inter-American jurisprudence. But yeah, I, I agree. It's okay, well, with that, we're, we are out of time. We're ending on time. This has been a fantastic presentation. Please uh, look at our website for future ones, and please check out our Human Rights Practicum and the conference that Daniela mentioned. Uh, please tell your friends and colleagues about it. Daniela, we thank you so much for your effort and for your great work, and we look forward to continuing these conversations throughout thank the Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. I'm so sorry. I, I think I, I talked so long, but uh, any other time we can continue our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.